there, NAS kids. Pastor Heather here. I'm so glad to see you. I miss you a lot, and I hope to see you on Sunday mornings at our 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock service. Um, we're meeting outside, and it's a lot of fun. I'm going to have some special treats this Sunday, so tell your mom and dad to sign you up and uh, come see me. Um, today, I'm going to share with you a little bit about the new series that we're going to start on Sunday, and we're going to start learning about the book of James. The book of James is in the New Testament, so it's after Jesus came and was born and died on the cross and rose again, and James is the brother of Jesus. Think about that for a minute. How would that be to have Jesus for a brother? Hmm. So, some important things to know about the book of James, besides that James was Jesus' brother, is that James is an English name. Do you have anybody that you know named James? Oh, there's some people watching named James right now. Hi, Jameses. So glad to see you. So James is an English name, but the Hebrew name that Jesus would have called his brother is Jacob. Can you think of anybody in the Bible named Jacob? I can. Remember we learned in the book of Genesis, we learned about Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob. So Jacob is the great, 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 lots of great grandfather of Jesus and this Jacob. So it's a family name. Isn't that cool? So we can call him James or we can call him Jacob, but in your Bible, you'll see it called James because this is an English Bible. So I'm going to read to you the first little bit of the first chapter of James, and then we're going to read a story about someone who put their faith into action because that is one of the things that the book of James teaches us. It teaches us a lot of little short ways to be wise and to be like Jesus. If you want to be like Jesus, can you jump up and down three times? One, two, three. Good job. I want to be like Jesus and I want you to be like Jesus too. So that's why we're going to study the book of James together. So let me start to read it. It says, greetings. My name is Jacob, and I am a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing this letter, that's the book of James, I'm writing it to the 12 tribes of Israel who have been sown like seas, scattered among all the different nations or countries. My fellow believers, Jacob says, when it seems as though you're facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy you can. Huh, when things are hard, James says that we can experience the greatest joy. Hmm. On Sunday, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about for you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there's nothing missing and nothing lacking. I wanna be mature. I wanna be perfect in Jesus. Do you? Do a little dance to say, yes, I do. In verse 5, it says, If anyone longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom, and he will give it. God won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you over your failures, but he will overwhelm your failures with his generous grace. Just make sure that you ask, empowered by confident faith without doubting, and you will receive. For the ambivalent person, not somebody who just can't decide, ambivalent. The ambivalent person believes one minute, and then they doubt the next. Being undecided makes you become like the rough driven seas in like, oh, like a ship tossed by the wind. When you're half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. I think I wanna be stable. I wanna be rock solid stable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the Lord when you're in that condition? No, but God doesn't see our condition. He sees his generous grace and he sees 
that God loves us and he sees that our failures don't have to be failures because we can trust in Jesus. So let's pray and then we're going to read a story. Okay, close your eyes, bow your head. All right, let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can um, grow up and be mature in our faith, that we can ask God for wisdom and he'll give it to us generously and he won't find our faults or our failures, but he'll make us wise. God, we need wisdom in our world. It's confusing and it's hard, it's difficult. So help us to ask you for help, for joy, and for wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, we're gonna read a story together. This story is of George Mueller. So George Mueller was a minister in 1833. One day, he strolled the streets of England, feeling fancy free. He jumped over the puddles from the rain the night before. He whistled as he walked and wondered what the future bore. A carriage passed and water splashed on his face, which made it gritty. George didn't care, for soon he knew he'd leave this crowded city. Though George had come from Prussia, it's called Germany today, he tired of tea and visiting, he didn't want to stay. Where was he? In England. Mm -hmm. He lived for months in Bristol among squalor and disease. He thought it would be challenging to serve God overseas. And recently, he got the money that he'd been waiting for to serve God as a missionary on another shore. He pushed past Bristol's poorest part along the cobbled street. He hardly saw the beggars who were wanting food to eat. But then, a little girl approached, dressed in a gunny sack. She carried a small toddler who was riding piggyback. Her dirt street face looked up at him and she so shyly said, can you please spare a shilling, sir? My ma and pa, they're dead. George crouched beside the little girl who looked no more than five years old. Her brother had a runny nose and he shivered from the cold. She said her name was Emily and then with great delight, she spelled her name for George and got a shilling for the night. George, George placed it in her unwashed hand. She straightened, feeling proud. She hitched her brother higher up while heading towards the crowd. George worried as he watched her disappearing out of sight. Where would she go? What would she eat? Where would she sleep that night? He felt so sad. His future plans completely changed that day. He'd stay in England helping kids who had no place to stay. So George, together with his wife, began a breakfast club. Soon, 30 kids attended from the streets and the local pub. They sat on apple boxes, not one ch single child stirred when George began to read aloud from God's own holy word. They ate big bowls of oatmeal, which they gobbled happily and they shoveled spoons of sugar in their warm, delicious tea. Now, many poor in Bristol weren't as fortunate as they, but lived within the poorhouse walls, an awful place to stay, where husbands, wives, and children all were forced to live their lives apart from one another, working hard just to survive. A baby boy named William had been born one morning there. His parents died when he was small yet no one seemed to care. Whenever little William went there, scurried rats and mice. At night, he hardly slept a wink. His bed had fleas and lice. Along with many others, William hoped to get away. He told a lie about an aunt inviting him to stay. So William went out on his own, now homeless on the street. He searched through bits of trash in hope of finding some food to eat. He danced and sang some funny songs to earn a coin or two. He found more ways he could survive the older that he grew. Now, meanwhile, George, not satisfied with what he had provided, 
he dreamed of a home for orphans and with faith and hope decided one day in church that he'd announce what he was going to do. I know that God will help to make this orphanage come true. I will not ask for money, but I will ask the Lord in prayer to meet the needs of every child who's placed within my care. Some members thought his plan would fail. Their minds were filled with doubt. Were there not more important things for God to care about? Yet money, food, clothing, and sheets were given generously to start a brand new orphanage, a Christian ministry. The years passed by, George was amazed as he watched God provide five, five spacious houses for his orphans in the countryside. Now, William was a boy of 12 when he came there to stay. So strange at first, it fell to him more like his home each day. His placement in the school, since he could not read or write, was in the kindergarten class. He studied hard each night. After many years, he found a job as he had planned. But before he left, George said, my lad, give me your hand. George placed a coin in his left palm, a Bible in his right. Hold tight to God's word, he said. Don't let it out of sight. You'll find there's always something in your other hand that way. Yes, God will take good care of you. Now, my boy, let's pray. One morning in the orphanage, 300 ch children met and stood around the breakfast table, which was so nicely set. But they stared at empty plates and they waited in the hall while George appeared relaxed, though there was no food at all. Surprisingly, George said to him, let's all Please take a seat and thank the Lord for giving us what we're all about to eat. Then suddenly a baker knocked and came in with a trip. I could not sleep because I thought you'd needed this bread today. Then the children ate their fill of warm and tasty bread. The milkman knocked. My cart is broken down outside, he said. I must unload my milk so I can fix it properly. Please take these bottles off my cart and drink them. They are free. The children, they were amazed how God had put food on their plate, right in the nick of time and not a minute late. George preached around the world and he traveled in the USA. The orphans who had grown up and moved away, there met him on his way. And in New Zealand, George spent all the time he could allow with a former street boy, William, a beloved pastor now. George grew old, he settled down, and he spent his final days surrounded by new orphans he could help in many ways. He strolled along the garden paths and talked to children there. He told them Bible stories in the open English air. At 92, George Mueller died while sleeping peacefully. He'd helped 10,000 orphans through his life, which we can see was a lived example of what each of us can do if we will put our faith in God and let him use us too. Wherever God may lead us, whether it be near or far, as George discovered through one girl, be helpful where you are. So my question is, what good can you do today? Our faith has to be put into practice. Loving God means loving your neighbor. So how can you love your neighbor today? Who's close by to you? Is it your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, maybe your grandma and grandpa, maybe a neighbor? What can you do today to help? Or has God maybe given you a dream? Maybe to help homeless people or orphans? Maybe to invent something like, an, like the Wright brothers in an airplane? or uh, a new computer that can do something new that helps people. There's all kinds of ways that God can work through you if you'll just listen to him. So right now I want you to sit in quiet for 10 minutes. Have your mom or dad set a timer or if you have a timer, 
set it for 10 minutes and I want you to sit quiet and I want you to ask God what God would want you to do to help somebody today. Love God, live as a family, and go make disciples. See you soon, guys.